Hello everyone, this is Professor Radigari, and in this lecture I'm going to talk about chapter 10, which deals with the product or the offering. So um, this kind of continues in our theme of uh, going through the four P's of marketing, product, price, place, and promotion. This is product, and this is the actual physical product um, and surrounding features that you're selling to the marketplace. So when we talk about product, we can talk about goods, we can talk about services. Uh, either one of those is considered a product. Uh, goods are tangible, services are intangible, but you also have features that go with the product like the brand name and a warranty and packaging, those types of things. We can roll all this stuff up into what we call the offering. So the offering is all the benefits um, of satisfaction provided to a target market. Okay, so again, functional product provides the core benefits. So for example, a mobile phone uh, provide you a way to talk to people and a way to check your email remotely. But it also has a brand name like Apple or iPhone. Those are two brand names associated with that particular phone. Um, it's got a strong reputation that's intangible, that's considered part of the offering. Uh, delivery setup instructions, customer service, customer support, those types of things, those are all related uh, to the product and a part of the offering. Warranties, guarantees, packaging, uh, repair, maintenance, service, those types of things are all considered part of the offering. So when you buy a phone, or a better example, when you buy a car, you're not just buying a car, you're buying the brand name, you're buying the, the repair uh, schedule that comes along with it, you're uh, buying the you know, powertrain warranty, for example. So it's not just about the car. Okay, so product can be anything that's marketed to satisfy a want or a need. Here we have different kinds of examples goods, services, experiences, events, people, places, properties, organizations, information, ideas. Uh, if you think about uh, election years, in election years there are uh, lots of uh, individuals who are marketed. Uh, President Obama, 2008, uh, was uh, very successful in marketing himself and his campaign was very successful in marketing him. So. Um, you know, ideas. We can talk about uh, PSAs about, you know, not littering and, and you know, making sure that you get enough exercise and eat enough nutrients. These are all ideas or information that can be um, marketed. Those are all considered a product, even though you can't physically touch it and, and you don't actually physically buy it. Okay, so within each product we have five product levels. You have the core benefit, uh, which is, you know, the basic, basic what it provides. So for a car, the basic or the core benefit is transportation. Okay, so the benefit is satisfied by the basic product, the expected product, the augmented product, and the potential product. So basic is quite simply what it does. Expected is what you hope it does. Uh, augmented is the you know, features above and beyond what it normally does, like Bluetooth and four-wheel drive and, you know, automatic door openers. You know, th those would be part of the augmented product. And potential product is just what the product could be down the road, okay? All right, so those are five different product le levels. Uh, you know, read, read, read in the book more carefully about them because clearly, um, there are some subtle differences here, and the book does a good job of kind of explaining the differences. I just want to give you some examples. Core benefit. What's the core benefit of a hotel? A place to sleep, right? What about a car? Transportation. What about a mobile phone? Communication. What about a drill? What does a drill do? It makes a hole. What does a sandwich do? It cures hunger. That's the core, that's the core benefit that a product provides. Uh, con continue along the line with those same products. What is the basic product? For a hotel, you get a room, you get a bathroom with a car, you get a sedan, convertible, four wheels, you know, tire, steering wheel, seats, those types of things. Mobile phone, what is it? You get an antenna. Well, you used to get an antenna, maybe not so much anymore. A keypad, a touch screen, those types of things. A drill, there's a cord, there's a trigger. Uh, it's plastic, it's durable. It's the basic product. Sandwich, what do you get? Turkey, mayonnaise, uh, vegetables, uh, bread. Okay, next layer uh, going outward is expected product, a hotel. 
What do we expect from a hotel? We don't expect a room with a bed and a bathroom. We expect more than that. We expect a clean bed. We expect fresh towels. We expect a, a, a quiet night so you can get some rest. A car, what do we expect? Comfortable seats, an engine that's reliable. Mobile phone, we expect an email feature. We expect it to um, not drop calls. You know, those are things we expect. A drill, what do we expect? Reliable drilling. Every time you want to make a hole, it makes a hole for you. Finally, a sandwich, what do we expect? We expect onion, tomato, we expect it to taste good. Um, it's just things we expect from the physical product itself. Okay, augmented product. And remember, these are just extras that can come along with the product. For a hotel, maybe it's a spa treatment, maybe it's a gym. For a car, maybe it's an MP3 player, maybe it's Bluetooth. Um, looks like my uh, animation here is out of order, but the mobile phone, uh, we expect a Twitter application, we expect Facebook, uh, things above and beyond just physically being able to call someone. What does a drill give us? Or what do we expect or, or how can we augment it? Have a diamond tip drill bit that allows you to drill through much harder surfaces. And then finally a sandwich. We can augment the sandwich through gourmet mustard. Instead of just using regular yellow French's mustard, Gourmet mustard would be a way to augment the product and kind of set it apart from others. And then finally, potential product. This is just what, at some point, could the product be in the future. So just note that these examples are a little bit silly um, because sometimes I try to inject my bad humor into lectures, but also I think going to the extreme kind of helps uh, explain the example. So first of all, The hotel, something we can expect, uh, you know, in the future, maybe potentially, is valet service. So, yes, this can be an augmented because a lot of hotels do have valet service already. But you know, in the future, maybe Motel Six will have valet service. That's a potential, you know, feature for them. Car, time travel. We, ex you know, potentially, maybe someday, cars can uh, be involved in time travel. Be pretty cool, huh? Mobile phone. Maybe you can use a mobile phone to start your car from afar, and uh, chances are maybe this is already possible. I just don't really know. But um, that's something potentially a phone could do in the future. Drill, automatic drilling. You just press, a, you have a remote control, and you press a button, and the drill comes up and it drills a hole. Um, automatic drilling. And then what about a sandwich? Zero calories. How about a zero calorie sandwich? This is some pipe dream we could hope for in the future. Never going to happen, but just an example of a potential product. So, potential products are kind of you know pie in the sky types of things. Um, don't really focus on those too much, but um, just note that there are things that the product doesn't provide that it possibly could provide in the future. And again, we don't have to go to this much extreme. I just did that for uh, illustration purposes. Okay. You know, maybe one would be for uh, a low-end car manufacturer to have, you know, enhanced reliability. Something they don't have now, but something potential for the future. Hyundai is a good example of this. Hyundai used to be a, a pretty substandard, substandard brand, substandard products with very poor reliability. Well, they're, they're not that anymore. So uh, the potential for higher reliability for Hyundai in the past has now been realized. Okay, when we think about products, we think about durability and tangibility. So non-durable goods are tangible goods normally consumed in one or a few uses. So a sandwich is an example of a non-durable non good. You use it and you're done. A band-aid. You use a band-aid for a little bit and you throw it out. If you kept the band-aid on for months at a time, that's just gross. So uh, those are non-durable goods. Durable goods are goods that will survive many, many uses washing machine, refrigerator, car, uh, computer, those types of things are durable. So when you think about physical goods, remember goods are tangible, services are intangible. Within goods, you have some that are durable and some that are non-durable. And the way you market each of these is completely different. You know, if you sell refrigerators, you sell a refrigerator to someone, um, are you hoping they come back next week and buy another refrigerator? Well, yeah. But that's not uh, realistic. So you know you've got to 
uh, target your message to get people in the door to buy the refrigerator, but also build some sort of relationship that way 20 years down the line when they need another refrigerator, they come back to you. Whereas if you're selling Subway sandwiches, you want to have a experience that is you know, so positive that next week or even tomorrow when, when they want another sandwich, they'll come back to you instead of going someplace else. Services, again, services are not goods. They're products, but they're not goods. Services are intangible, inseparable. They're variable and they're perishable. Okay. So when we say services are inseparable, that means that you cannot separate purchase time from consumption time. Okay. You purchase the service, boom, it's done, it's gone, you've used it. Okay. Thinking more about durable versus non-durable. Generally, durable products are more expensive. Think refrigerator versus sandwich. Um, durable products are bought infrequently. Non-durable products are bought more frequently. Again, think refrigerator and sandwich. Just think about that for all these, all these, uh, all these bullet points. Durable products, you have more selling efforts. Non-durable products have less. So refrigerators or cars, you've got salespeople there to kind of illustrate all the features to you and talk about why it's great and why it's better than competition and all this stuff. You go into Subway or, yeah, you go into Subway, no one's going to try to sell you on their sandwich because you're, you know, it's just a sandwich. And so that's a little bit of a bad example because you're already in the Subway, but you're not going to have people walking down the street trying to sell you a Subway sandwich, and arguing that Subway is better than Quiznos and McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and wherever else because, you know, not that much selling effort is required. You know, just really not. Durable products have higher margins, no doubt. Again, you're going to make a lot more money per sale on, off a refrigerator than you are off of a sandwich. Durable products have more services. You've got warranties, you've got guarantees, you've got extended warranties. Um, you've got service and maintenance contracts, those types of things. It'd be really weird to have a maintenance contract for a sandwich, wouldn't you think? So which type of product is relationship marketing more important? Is relationship marketing more important for durables or for non-durables? If you want to pause and think about that for a second, certainly uh, go right ahead and do that. And the answer is really, it depends. And, and marketing frustrates people in a lot of ways because for most questions, the answer is always, well, it depends. So on the one hand, Relationship marketing is more important for non-durable goods because you want them to come back again and again and again and buy your products. Whereas when you look at durable, it's like, well, they're not going to come back for 20 years, so once we have sold them the product, why should we spend any effort you know, trying to build this relationship when we know they won't be back in 20 years regardless? So on the one hand, that's kind of the point of view. The other hand is, well, actually that's not true because if you sell them a good product at a good price, at a good warranty, they're going to tell other people, um, sure they may not need another refrigerator for 20 years, but maybe the dishwasher breaks down or they need a washer and dryer, those types of things. So I guess we could say maybe it's a little bit more important for non-durable, but it's not. there's not a wide gap in importance between the two, that's for sure. All right. If we look at consumer goods, these are goods, uh, intangible. I'm sorry, tangible products purchased by end users. We can break these into different categories. One is convenience goods. These are products that are purchased frequently, immediately with little effort, like a Coca-Cola, uh, pack of gum, you know, potato chips, those types of things. Shopping goods. Um, with shopping goods, you're going to spend more time considering the different options, different prices, uh, quality, price, style. Uh, think about clothes, for example. You don't just go to the store and pick out one dress or one pair of pants and you're done. You know, you compare. You compare on the basis of of these different attributes, and so there, there you do some shopping. 
takes some effort, much more effort than convenience goods. So that's uh, those are shopping goods, specialty goods. Unique characteristics for which a sufficient number of buyers are willing to make a special purchasing effort. Okay. So if you think about think about products that are Christmas specific. These are specialty goods. These are goods that won't be sold, you know, ten months out of the year. So on the one hand, well why do you do this? The reason is you have enough people that are willing to buy in that particular time of year to make it worth it. So, you know, Christmas trees and Christmas ornaments and things related to Christmas we could we could call specialty goods. Unsought goods, these are goods that consumers don't know about or don't normally think of buying. Um, we can talk about impulse products, pack of gum in the checkout aisle, uh, you know, things like that. Um, maybe you're uh, at a shopping center, a mall, or whatever, and you're walking down the walking down the aisle, and you smell the smell of cookies coming from a store. Well, you weren't thinking about buying cookies until you smelled the cookies. So this is an example of an unsought good. And don't think there's a stigma related to unsought goods. There's really not. There's no. There's no implication that unsought goods are, are somehow subliminally or forcefully marketed to people. It's just, you know, you go into the store looking for some things, you have a, a shopping list, uh, but while you're in there, something else catches your eye and say, oh, well, I didn't need that, or I didn't think I need that, but yeah, I'm going to get that. That's an unsought good. Okay, switching gears a little bit. So we've been talking about individual products, but what about companies, and most companies are like this, have multiple products? Just how do we, how do we kind of organize and, and, and uh, set our marketing strategy when we have all these different types of products? Well, we've got some, some terms we refer to, and the book does a good example of explaining, but we've got what's called product mix. Um, within your product mix, you have width you have length, and you have depth. And we'll talk about each of these. Uh, I've got some examples here to show you. Um, and we have product consistency. Consistency is just basically how similar are all your products to one another. And then we have product lines. So again, I'll show you some, of, some graphical examples of these. Okay, this is, this is General Motors, and this is an old product chart or brand chart for General Motors. Because some of these brands no longer exist, but you've got General Motors, the corporate company, and they create all these different brands and all these sub brands. So Chevrolet, GMC, Cadillac, Hummer, and you know, those are Buick. Those are examples of product lines. Okay. The number of lines you carry is product width. Okay. So if you have eight brands or eight product lines. You have wider product product width than another company that has only four product lines. Okay, product depth is just how many different products you sell in each product line. So Cadillac, you've got the CTS, the STS, the DTS, and their SRX, and I'm sure there are others. But um, that's depth. You know, Hummer, there's the H1, the H2, the H3. So it's not nearly as deep as Cadillac. Okay, so your GM, you sell these products, you fall on hard times. Some products sell better than others. So at some point, you've got to decide if, if you're kind of a sinking ship, and General Motors was a few years ago, you have to decide, you have to make some hard decisions. Well, maybe we need to get rid of some of these. Maybe we need to replace them with some new brands. So, and all this is considered product line analysis, and you're just evaluating the profitability of each product line and trying to figure out if, if some should be eliminated. Okay? And obviously you compare yourself to the competition to see where you're, where you're strong, where you have uh, some room to grow, and just how you can position yourself to um, better compete. Okay? So with product line analysis you may decide to add more brands or take some away. 
Okay, so pruning. If you consider our, our previous chart here, I'll go back to it. GM, you had eight product lines. Well, how does GM look now? Well, they've, they've basically cut themselves down to three. I'm not, I'm sorry, no, they're more than three. Uh, they, they now have Chevrolet, GMC, Cadillac, Buick. I'm not, I think they sold Hummer, I'm not exactly sure, but Saturn and Pontiac and Oldsmobile are no longer in existence. So they, what they did is they pruned those product lines. They basically just got rid of them. Okay. So pruning can also apply to product depth as well. Um, Chevrolet uh, at one point had the Chevy Camaro and then decided to get rid of it. So they pruned product depth under the Chevrolet line, but they've added it back. Uh, so pruning is just cutting product line, product depth, uh, just some way to get rid of particular products in your product portfolio. Okay. So product line length, product line width, these are pretty much interchangeable terms. Line stretching is when you actually add a new product line. Okay, so General Motors has, you know, GMC, Cadillac, um, all these brands. At one point, they added Saturn. Okay, so Saturn was a new brand, a new product line that was added in the late 1980s. Uh, so when they add a, added that product line, what, line, what they did is they stretched. They stretch uh, their, their product line, okay? And uh, basically, the way to explain this is technically product line is when you kind of extend your range. So you've got low, low quality products and medium quality products, okay? So you, you, you range from low to medium, for example. Then you decide to add high quality products at the at one end of the spectrum. So what you've done is you've extended from low to medium quality to all the way low, all the way to high quality. So that technically that is what line stretching is. But we can say when, when we add new brands in the middle, uh, it, it's somewhat stretching, but um, it's a little different. Okay, so a down market stretch is when you introduce a lower priced offering. An up market stretch is when you enter the higher end of the market. So, a good example of an up market stretch, well, I'll just show you in a minute. Two way stretch is when you add both higher and lower end uh, markets, or, or ends of the spectrum to your product lines, to your product line length, that is. So, an up market stretch. Uh, in the late 80s, Toyota added Lexus, and Honda added Acura, and Nissan added Infiniti. Uh, way back when, General Motors added Cadillac, so those are considered upmarket stretch. You're going after the higher end of the market. Two-way stretch, GM added Cadillac, and they added Daewoo. Now, they didn't do these at the same time, so it's not a perfect example, uh, but just want to give you, show you over time that it, General Motors has engaged in a two-way stretch. Down market stretch. Good example is Cadillac came out with this dreadful car called the Cadillac Cimarron, which was basically a Chevy Cavalier with uh, uh, some Cadillac furnishings. Uh, it was not a good product. Didn't do well at all. Another example is uh, Porsche. Porsche in the late 60s and into the 70s, I believe. Uh, introduced the Porsche 914, which is this little bitty Porsche which had a Volkswagen engine in it, and so it was it was the low end of the Porsche market. It allowed them to capture some, you know, some low end profits, but um, you know, it, it's a far cry from the other Porsche models throughout the years. Okay, so why stretch? You know, clearly it's to reach new target markets. What are the drawbacks? change the meaning of your brand, you know, in a lot of ways. If you if you've always owned Porsche 911s, you know, the big fancy Porsches, and all of a sudden they've added these 914s that that other people can afford, now it's like, well, my car is no longer you know, really that exclusive. So, uh, if anyone can have a Porsche now, then it may lose to some people some of its luster. Okay? So that's the problem. Um, you know, if you talk about an up market stretch, the danger is that it may not be believable that the higher quality products are indeed high quality. If you're an average quality brand and you try to 
reach out into the upper, you know, the upper ends of quality. You know, it just might not be believable. It, not, it just might not be received. So, um, what companies do sometimes in order to reach a new end of the spectrum without harming their existing brands or existing images, they'll just create a product with a new brand name. Okay, and this is exactly what Lexus and uh, Acura for. Instead of creating a luxury high-end Toyota, Lexus just said, well, we'll just call it a Lexus and uh, we'll be done. And same thing with Acura. So it allows them to separate themselves and consumers' minds from themselves, so to speak. So Lexus is high end, Toyota is you know is high is is reliable but not necessarily considered luxury. So it allows them to have two brands, each of their own identity, without kind of harming one another. Line filling. This is where you fill the gaps in between. So this I misspoke a little bit ago when I talked about Saturn. Saturn is actually was an example of line filling. It was a uh, supposed to be a higher quality product than the. Chevrolet sedans, but only a little bit. Um, it was created to try to compete against the Japanese uh, automakers and their presence in the U.S. So why do this? Clearly, just to, there's another target market out there that you have not been able to reach. Line modernization. This is where you continually update your products with new, you know, new and uh, better features, better options, those types of things. Uh, uh, Apple continually does this with their iPad and their iPhone. You know, it allows them to stimulate sales and stimulate growth and stimulate interest and continually provide consumers with you know, better and better, more modern products. So, so, Sony had the Sony Walkman way back when, and they moved to the mini disc, and they moved to the uh, MP3 player, and then you had the the VCR or the DVD player and you have the Blu-ray player so um, just allowed, allows them to continually update their product lines and continually spur interest and uh, generate sales in their target markets. Featuring, what is this? Featuring is just used to, to boost demand for slower sellers. So a good example is GM reminds people that Cadillac is a GM product So by doing that, people that can't afford Cadillac will say, hey, you know, we can't afford a Cadillac, but, you know, you know, Chevy Malibu is a GM product too, so there's got to be some sort of uh, commonality there, so we're going to go with that. That's what featuring is. You just you put your flagship brand out front to kind of promote everything else. Another good example is if you've ever seen Budweiser commercials. Uh, most commercials you see on TV for Budweiser are actually for Budweiser. They're not for Bud Light. You know, but Bud Light, I believe, far outsells uh, regular Buds. So uh, they use Budweiser, their flagship product, to stimulate sales for Bud Light. All right, kind of changing gears. Uh, another part of the product of the offering is packaging. It's just, it's just everything related to products container. Okay, so the box that comes in, uh, yeah, just how it's handled, what information is actually on the packaging. This is all, uh, all part of the offering. So it's influenced by self-service. If it's a product you just go and pick up on your own, no one has to deliver it, uh, that can Im influence how the product is packaged. Uh, consumer affluence, you know, you go to Tiffany's, you're going to get a, a nice blue, you know, high quality blue box that the, the product comes in. Um, you know, Tiffany uses that box as a as a promotional tool or as a a deliberate part of their marketing strategy. Even though it's just a box that the ring or the necklace came in, uh, it's it's a significant part of the offering, a significant part of their marketing strategy. Okay. Some things to consider when we engage in packaging. Um, first thing is. The package has to identify the brand, identify the product. If not, what do you got? Nothing. You've got nothing. It has to give some information about what's inside the package. Okay, so if you think about food products, 
Uh, Betty Crocker cake mix. The box indicates what kind of cake is in there, what flavor is it. Um, you know, if it's got Hershey's chocolate they're in it, they'll have a Hershey's you know chocolate syrup logo on there. So uh, usually it's got some you know eye appealing features to um, hopefully persuade you to purchase it. Okay. It allows you to um, transport or protect the product. Again, a, a box of Betty Crocker cake mix. Uh, it's easy to carry. Uh, it's easy to store. It's going to be protected from the elements, uh, from you know bugs and dirt and things in your home until you decide to use it. Um, and also can aid in product consumption. Think about a, a bottle of of Coke, Coca Cola. That is, you know, not only does that not only is that bottle packaging, but it has the, you know, the, the mouth on it to allow you to consume the product straight from the bottle. Uh, you know, Morton Salt, they've got the canister with the little, the little spout that opens so you can pour the salt out. You know, same thing. That packaging helps you consume the product. If, if it didn't have that, you would have to take the top off and stick a spoon in there, and it's just uh, much less efficient. So Morton does a good job in the packaging. When considering packaging options, you've got to, you know, test to make sure that it's that it's effective, that it's it's both uh, eye appealing and uh, attracts people, and also that it's not going to fall apart. Okay. Here's some kind of creative examples here. On the top left, you've got uh, strawberry juice. Uh, I don't believe this is an American product. I believe this is somewhere from Europe. Uh, so what do you got here? You've got a product that the package. What does it do? It illustrates what's in it, strawberry juice. It's eye appealing, and also it's got a spout there on the top where you can physically drink right from the right from the package. Pretty clever. On the top right there, you've got Doritos, toasted corn. It comes in this little box. You know, kind of pop it out, and it opens up to where it's now a, a serving tray. Pretty cool, huh? And then finally, coconut water comes in a little coconut shell. Very attractive. Very eye appealing. Catches your attention and. Uh, helps sell the product, but also protects it as well. All right, warranties, guarantees. These are just you know formal statements that uh, basically allow firms to stand by their quality, stand by their products, and also give us as consumers uh, some assurance that uh, the product's going to work, and if it doesn't, they're going to take care of us. So it reduces perceived risk. Okay. So a warranty is, generally warranties are, are more explicit, you know, this is what we're going to offer you, six years, 60,000 miles, warranty will replace anything that goes wrong with the car. You know, guarantee is just more of a kind of a satisfaction guarantee. If you're not happy, bring it back, and uh, we'll replace it. So you see warranties more with durable products, and you see guarantees more with just, uh, you know, less durable products. L.L. Bean has the greatest guarantee I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with with L.L. Bean or not, or not, but their their products are guaranteed with 100% satisfaction, anytime, any place, any reason. You can buy a product there, you can use it for 20 years, completely wear it out, return it. They'll they'll give you a new one or something similar to one if they don't carry it anymore, for absolutely nothing. They don't want you to be unhappy. They want you to be happy. They want you to spread positive word of mouth. They want you to come back and buy more products. So they unquestionably a unconditional guarantee. I had a pair of moccasins a number of years ago that I wore them for probably you know six or eight years and completely wore them out. Sent them back. They gave me a brand new pair. No questions asked. I think I had to pay the shipping, you know, four or five bucks. And that was it. It's pretty incredible. It allows them to keep consumers happy, to spread word of mouth, and uh, next time they need maybe not moccasins but something else, uh, you'll go back there and you'll buy something else from them. So it's 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 purely genius. Okay, new product development process. Uh, you know, the chapter kind of switches gears and talks about how you come up with creating new products. There's this flow chart. You can just read it. I'm not going to go through it here, but just uh, you got to have ideas and you have to test the ideas and then figure out a way to commercialize those ideas. 
So innovation, what is innovation? Innovation is just um, this development of, of completely new products, completely new ideas. Um, when we say innovation, diffusion, we're talking about how fast does the innovation become adopted by the marketplace. Okay, so some products it takes a long time for, for that product or for the market to you know become regular users of the product. Others it's, it's really, really fast. So if you think about Apple, if each time they introduce a new iPhone, people sit outside their stores for a week camping out, which I think is a little bit crazy. Uh, no offense if any of you have actually done that. Uh, but, um, you know, so they diffuse very rapidly. Then we have, we can talk about radical versus incremental innovation. Radical innovation is something that's completely, totally new. It's a new idea, it's fundamentally different than anything before. Incremental innovation, on, uh, on the other hand, is just some minor change, you know, less radical. So when iPhone comes out with a new phone and now has two cameras instead of one, is that radical? No, that's just incremental. They just add a little bit to it. So we can say all the new additions of the iPhone or the iPad are, are more on the incremental innovation side. There's nothing earth shattering that they haven't already uh, introduced. TV, when, when TV first came out it was completely radical. The idea that you could watch moving pictures on a little screen in your living room was just completely unheard of. You know, the same thing with the radio before that. The internet, you know, once, once the internet became popular, that was a very radical innovation. But look at this. Back in the 80s you had the Sony Walkman. The one on the right has no radio. The one, uh, the one on the left does have a radio. So going from no radio to radio, it's a very small, very minor change. That would be considered a incremental innovation. Important to note in new product development is that greater than 90% of all new products fail. So you have to uh, be sure that you do your due diligence, bad market research a lot of times uh, relates, uh, results this in this. Think about New Coke. New Coke's market research was very, very flawed. They did a bunch of taste tests. People decided they liked the new flavor better than the old flavor. But the, taste, the, the test was blind. So they didn't know it was Coke uh, at all. Uh, so they said, well, if they like the taste better, they're going to buy more of the, of the new taste than the old taste. So we're just going to switch out and start selling new Coke instead of old Coke. Well, they didn't do research on the brand itself to see if people would actually consider uh, being receptive to the new formula of Coke, and it didn't work out. So their, their market research was bad. They went just on taste. And clearly, with most products, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, sometimes they overestimate the market size. You say, well, there's 30 million people that could use this product. Well, probably not. Uh, it's very common to overestimate market size. Uh, underestimate competition. This happens a lot, especially in, uh, in small business. Someone will come into a small town, want to open a sports bar, and say, well, there's no competition. We'll be the only sports bar in town. Well, there are other little bars that may have a TV. They may not promote themselves as a sports bar. Uh, but uh, if it's a place where people can go to watch the game and drink a beer, uh, it's competition. So uh, you've got to be careful that you don't underestimate the competition. Development costs, sometimes the costs are just too high and they can't ever be recouped. Um, quite simply, bad marketing. Maybe you've got a great idea and the market is very receptive and your competition is, is, uh, is moderate and it wasn't too expensive to make. But maybe your just marketing is no good. That happens a lot of times, for sure. All right, still thinking about innovation and creating new products. Uh, we have what are called adoption process stages. So stages in which we adopt products. So first we need to be aware of a product before we can actually purchase the product. So if you're not aware about it, what is there? Nothing. So awareness is created through advertising. Interest, once we're aware of the product, maybe we'll spur some kind of interest. Um, the mild interest kind of can, can then uh, escalate to evaluation. Well, let's just go check it out, see what it's all about. Uh, may lead to a trial. Well, let's try the product, see if we like it. 
maybe we'll consider it. And then adoption is where you actually physically purchase the product or use a product, whatever it might be. Okay, so example here, this is a compact iPack. It was an old MP3 player. Actually, I had this MP3 player. When they first came out, I was very hesitant. Um, I became aware about it, aware of it, but never really, uh, you know, for a while, wasn't really interested. And over time, I kind of waited and, and uh, read reviews and saw what other people were thinking about it and, and what their experiences were with it before I eventually ended up buying it. But uh, so I moved through these different stages in the adoption process. So what influences adoption rate? First of all, relative advantage. If you have a, a significant advantage over the competition, the market is going to adopt your products much quicker than if you have just a minor advantage or even no advantage at all. Uh, compatibility. Is it compatible with products you already have? Is it compatible with you know, your lifestyle, with your outlook on things? Is it compatible with your needs even? Complexity. Uh, the more complex a product is, the slower uh, the rate of adoption. It just people need to understand it. Divisibility. Can you can it be broken up into groups? If, if you can kind of break it up, uh, it can enhance the adoption rate. So, um, kind of a kind of a bad example, but gets the point across. As you think about if you think about Coca-Cola, you've got two liters and you have six packs. You know, theoretically, if you had never heard of Coca-Cola, uh, you wouldn't want to buy the big two liter until you've actually tried it. So why buy a whole two liter when you can buy something, you know, one little individual can and just try it out before you go out and spend the extra money on the larger version. Okay, so divisibility is a big deal. Communicability. If you're able to successfully communicate the benefits of the product and what the product does, it's going to certainly enhance the adoption rate. Something else that impacts adoption rate is the personal characteristics of the, the, market, the, the market itself. So uh, basically, we, when we adopt innovations, we adopt it at different rates. Uh, some people are called innovators. These are the people that want to, the, want to be the first ones to have the new innovation. These are the people that camp outside the Apple store. Okay. Then you have early adopters. These are the people that that adopt it pretty early. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, buy it the day it comes out. But I'll just wait and see. You know, just a short couple days to see how the reviews are on them and buy it. Early majority. These people that buy it, you know, relatively quick, but not as fast as innovators and early adopters. And you've got late majority, late majority of people that kind of wait and sit on their hands and really need it before they go by. And then laggards, these are the people that wait forever, uh, if at all. Okay. It's important to note that we all differ on our rate of adoption. It's also important to note that we also differ per product category. So uh, on some in some categories, I may be an innovator. Other categories, I might be a laggard. When it comes to electronics and you know, gadgets, those things, I, I certainly late, I'm certainly late majority or maybe even a laggard. I just want to uh, make sure that it's going to turn out. And I'm wary of, of brand new technologies uh, when we don't know what the long term uh, impacts or quality or effects are going to be. So I, I tend to be more of a laggard in that in that respect. But other things, I'm going to be. I'm going to be early. Uh, so that's innovation adoption. And we have product life cycle. Uh, products go through different stages of life, just like humans do. We've got the introduction phase where a product is brand new. Uh, we've got the growth phase where it starts to take off. It's being adopted by people. Uh, then you've got maturity. The product is pretty well established in the marketplace, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of room for growth and decline, the product goes away. Uh, another chart from the book kind of shows the relationship between sales and profit among the four different stages. So in introduction, you've got low sales, but you've got even lower profit because, um, negative profit even, because you've, you've got R&D costs, you've got things, you've got you know, uh, startup costs that need to be recouped, so you're not going to make any money in the, in the introduction stage. Uh, 
And like I said, in growth, the sales start to take off. You start to gain profits. Um, you get into the maturity stage. Sales continue to climb for a while. Your profit climbs for a while. And then at some point, profit starts to decline. Sales start to decline. Either there's less interest in your product either because people just don't want to buy it anymore or there's a better competitor or um, everyone that was going to buy your product pretty much has it now so there's really no uh, no more people to sell it to and then you go into decline decline your sales start to drop rapidly uh, and your your profit uh, near zero okay so if you're in the introduction stage uh, some things to consider you need to inform potential customers you need to get people to try your product, you need to figure out distribution channels, people to actually sell your product. Um, we have this notion of the pioneering advantage. The idea is the first one to market has this advantage because people are going to buy their product first, they become the standard bearer, they become the benchmark, all those things. But is this always an advantage? And that's really a, a poorly worded question because the, the, the word always in a question like that is always very dangerous. It, because always, there are very few things that we can consider are always something. Okay, so the answer is no. Pioneering is not always an advantage. You bear the brunt of the marketing cost. So if you're the first one to introduce an MP3 player, uh, you're the first one that's introducing the market to the mp3 player category so when a, a follower competitor in, enters the market the market already knows a lot about mp3 players because of the pioneer so in essence the pioneer has subsidized some of the early awareness effort of all the followers so that's a problem free riders you know same thing kind of relates to marketing costs is uh, people know about a particular product category now because of the pioneers efforts uh, market uncertainties. If you're the first in the market, uh, people are going to be concerned because it's brand new. You, you don't know how it's going to pan out. I mentioned this a minute ago when we were talking about rate of adoption. But you know, the, the first time that an MP3 three player was on the market, you know, that first day, people had no idea if it was going to work, what it was like, what it was all about. You know, are people actually going to go out and buy this thing? So. But if you're the follower, um, ideally you're going to be following, you know, pioneers that have been successful. If someone enters and, and the market kind of says, no, no, thank you, then you're not going to follow them, probably, because the market isn't ready or isn't uh, adaptable to that particular new product. So you've got um, you've to be careful if you're the pioneer because you're kind of, um, you know, going in somewhat blind. There's always a market shakedown where it takes a while for people to understand what's going on in the market. You know, again, MP3 players is a great example of that. Uh, there could always be a shift in customer needs. Um, you go, you enter the market. You've got this completely new innovation, this completely new product. Uh, consumers say, well, it, it's kind of okay, but we wish you would do this, this, and this. So your your customer wants and needs have kind of shifted a little bit. Another problem is what's called net network externalities, and this really only applies to certain product categories. And what ex market externality or network externalities are are quite simply um, basically one particular product. Uh, the use of one product depends on someone else using the same product. So, for an example, a cell phone. No, nope. I'm sorry, let, let me back up. Go back to the original telephone. What's the problem with the very first person that bought a telephone? He has to have someone else that also owns a phone, or he has no one to call. Fax machines, cell phones, email, those types of things. Uh, they rely on multiple people having the, the same product, the same capability, the same access. Because if not, what do you got? You've got nothing. So when fax machines were first introduced, the big problem was 
well, why should I buy a fax machine? There, no one else has a fax machine, so who am I going to fax? So um, that's called market, uh, network externalities, and, and can be a big deal, can be a big problem for pioneers. Okay. A uh, good example of when Pioneer was not an advantage was uh, when uh, videotapes first came out. Okay, VHS, which what you see here is was was the standard bearer uh, for videotapes for however long they were popular. Uh, however, they were not the Pioneer. The Pioneer was Betamax, the Betamax format introduced by Sony, and so. Betamax incurred all the marketing costs. Um, they were exposed to the market uncertainties. Uh, they did a poor job of promoting themselves. VHS came in, uh, capitalized on the marketing costs that were already incurred by Betamax. Uh, they es essentially were a free rider and were able to successfully market themselves as an improvement over Betamax. And Betamax didn't last very long. Uh, VHS, like I said, was a standard bearer for. I don't know, 25 years, and I guess you can probably still find them, but uh, they're certainly not common. Uh, kind of related to a, a recent recent slide also is the VHS now is certainly is in the decline phase of their product life cycle. So they're still sold, but not nearly as much. Uh, so. You're in the growth stage. Improve quality, add new features, you know, enter new segments, start to increase your distribution coverage. Uh, try to move from awareness to preference advertising. Uh, you know, you've already got the early adopters uh, buying your products. It's time now to lower your price to um, go after more price sensitive uh, consumers. Okay. If you're mature, what do you do? Somehow you modify the market. You expand it by increasing the number of users, uh, increasing the rate in which existing users actually use the product. Maybe you modify the product. It's another way. Or you change your marketing. You promote the product in a different way. Or you sell it in a different location. Uh, you do something different from a marketing standpoint. Decline stage. You can harvest, divest, or liquidate. Harvest, you're just basically, you're just kind of moving along and um, you decide, well, it's time to get rid of this product. We're going to just no longer carry it. We're going to sell off what we have and just be done. Uh, divest, you're going to sell it to someone who wants to buy it, whoever that might be. Okay. There are arguments to keep products that are that are in decline stage. If you've got no R and D costs, minimal production costs, there's really no need to to market it because the people that want it already know about it. There's an argument that you might as well just keep products that are in the decline stage because uh, they may make you a little bit of profit because you you don't have to put much effort into it. That's it for chapter ten. That was a long lecture. That's a very important chapter. I wanted to get through all those different concepts. So uh, if you have any questions. Please do not hesitate uh, to let me know. You certainly know where to find me. So have a great week, and we'll talk soon.